your eye. Okay, he reckons he's on Judy. Yep, there he is. He's wearing, he's wearing a suit. <laughs> Neil, there you Good. go. I can't see him yet. He needs to speak for me to see him. He's on mute. You're on mute, Rolf. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow, Rolf, look at you. Can you see me? I've got the light flashing and... <laughs> Good morning. Not to fall Good asleep. Evening. Uh, <laughs> Good evening. No, it's Good evening. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, guys. Good, Good afternoon. Good morning and good evening. Is that what you said? No, it's, all more, it's all morning. It's what 12.01 a.m. Yeah, it's morning now. <laughs> Not here. I'm bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. It's 9 a.m. here. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> It is start time here, but I, I, uh, I'm thinking maybe we'd just give it a couple minutes. The live stream has started. All right, we're going to start in one minute. Okay. Oh, they did bring you your coffee. Pardon? I had, uh, he didn't bring any coffee at first. Your coffee. Oh, yeah, no, but I, you I got finished. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's been keeping me going. Just bring it to me, yeah. Yep, come on in. We're about to get started. Please come in. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the presentation at COP26 in the Buildings and We Mean Business Pavilion about the Global Resiliency Dialogue. My name is Judy Zakreski. I'm the Vice President of Global Services at the International Code Council. And I have uh, with me some distinguished colleagues who I will introduce in time. Um, first, I'd like to welcome our live audience as well as our live streaming audience. And I'd like to invite everyone to participate in the conversation today um, by using Slido, which is an app that you can uh, log onto from your computer or your smartphone. Um, you can use the QR code that is on the screen right now and enter code 755926. There's a Q&A function there. Um, and there, if there are questions there, you can promote them. If there's something that's interest, interesting to you, we will monitor those questions and ask them at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to put questions into that Slido at any time during this um, presentation. And I think that the um, in studio, in in-person audience can also use the Slido platform to sort of keep everything equitable so we have everything in one place. And I'll, I'll provide this information again uh, as we go through. And finally, I'd just like to let everyone know that this, uh, this presentation is being recorded um, and will be available um, for for a long time to uh, to colleagues who are not able to join us and uh, to anyone else who you're interested in sharing this with. 
I'd like to start by providing everyone with an overview of the Global Resiliency Dialogue. What is it? We're a very small group, and so I will not be surprised if many of you do not know who we are or, or if you haven't heard of us. Um, the Global Resiliency Dialogue was launched in October of 2019 as an outgrowth um, of uh, the Interjurisdictional Regulatory Collaboration Committee, the IRCC, which is a group of um, building regulators from around the world, uh, mostly using performance-based building codes. Um, we, uh, several members of the IRCC, wanted to take a deeper dive on issues related to building resiliency um, and building code development uh, and, and how to marry climate science and building science. And so um, we got together the, the sort of like-minded uh, organizations from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States um, using the moniker Kansas. Um, got started to get together and and see what we could do collaboratively in this space. And so we held an initial meeting um, in October 2019 in um, Huntington Beach, California. And that go the goal of that initial meeting was to find a path to collectively identify solutions to help address the global challenge that's posed by the impact of increasingly frequent and extreme weather events and hazard risks on buildings and structures. Especially, um, we had identified flooding, high wind events, cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, um, wildfires or bushfires, and heat waves, or just extreme heat. Um, the two-day meeting uh, in California culminated in an agreement on the findings on changing risk and building codes. Um, and that was an agreed upon internal call to action um, for the, the, the organizations present to work towards evolving building codes to use forward-looking climate science to ensure resilience to future hazards. Um, and this small working group composed of um, building development and research organizations in the Kansas countries um, decided to start by undertaking two surveys. The first one um, was published in January of 2021, and that was a look at how building codes uh, globally, uh, not only in our four countries, but in some additional countries, are using, um, currently um, addressing weather hazards. Um, and that was called the use of climate data and assessment of extreme weather event risks in building codes around the world. Um, for that, we gathered data from the four Kansas partners, plus Germany, the Netherlands, um, Norway and Japan. And the takeaway from that survey, um, which you can find on the website, all of this you can find on the globalresiliency.org website that's listed on your screen. Um, the takeaway uh, was that nearly all building codes around the world are using historical data um, when drawing flood maps and looking at wind events, temperature ranges. Um, and so we, we, we thought that was the case. Um, and so then we decided to undertake a second survey um, that was engaging a wider range of stakeholders, but just focused in the four, country, the four Kansas countries. Um, and that, that survey was meant to address the challenges and needs um, that are present in each of those countries to move towards more forward-looking building codes. And that is the subject of today's presentation. So we um, just released the report this week of the survey findings in all four countries. Um, that's also now available on the website, as well as some um, more comprehensive takeaways from most of the countries. Um, and that report is called Delivering Climate Responsive resilient building codes and standards, and they're all available on uh, the globalresiliency.org website. With that, I would like to introduce a special guest we have here today, um, Alice Hill, who uh, is the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, Alice's work at CFR focuses on the risks, consequences, and responses associated with climate change. And Alice previously served as a special assistant to President Barack Obama and a senior director for resilience policy at the National Security Council staff, where she led the development of national policy to build resilience to catastrophic risks, including climate change and biological threats. Alice has published multiple books. Um, 
including the most recent one, the fight for climate after COVID-19. But more to the point of today's discussion, Alice moderated the two-day meeting that we held in Newport Beach, and that kicked off the Global Resiliency Dialogue. So it's especially wonderful that she happens to be here in Glasgow at COP26, and we were able to rope her in here um, to see what we've been up to for the past two years. And um, I've taken moderator's privilege and invited her here to share some brief comments and to provide some context for our discussion. Thank you for being here, Alice. Thank you, Judy. What a pleasure to rejoin the Global Resiliency Dialogue after two years. I will say that our conversation um, back in California inspired me to include more about building codes in my work on resilience. It's an issue that, of course, has been with humans for thousands of years. Uh, we have relied on building codes to protect property and life uh, safety. Um, but as Judy just mentioned, those codes have for those thousands of years based, been based on what we've, the extremes we've experienced in the past. And with climate change, it turns out that that assumption is where very quickly becoming a lousy assumption, a lousy uh, choice for underpinning all of our codes. We need to find ways, as this group has been focused on, to address the deeper droughts, the stronger storms, more powerful rainfall, greater heat in our building codes so that communities, Households, individuals can bounce back more quickly, reduce their damage from these events, and really humans can continue to thrive. The challenge, of course, is that no one's ever done this before. If you step back, no one in the history of the world has systematically had to plan for future very unfamiliar risk. Uh, and that's what this group has joined together uh, and shown that if we all can work together and learn from each other, hopefully we don't need to reinvent the wheel when we're making choices about what this new codes should look like. To have municipalities, states, uh, national governments all do this kinds of work without collaboration uh, will take us more time than we can afford, but it will also mean that we will uh, waste resources because there's so much we can learn from each other going forward. That's why I was so excited to see this survey and to see that it focused on what are the barriers? What do we need to work on to remove the obstacles to consideration of future risk? What are the data needs? We're not going to do this without data. Uh, we've used the historical data to great advantage for many, many years. What kind of data do we need to look forward uh, ahead? And where do we share common goals, common experience that we can benefit from each other's experience and advance our own nation's or community's needs? All of us uh, in this room and uh, listening to this recognize the need for strong building codes, strong enforcement to reduce harm. Uh, and in all of my work in resilience, this is at the core. As I step back and you look at human economic growth, it's going to depend on having communities that not only protect people uh, when the bad things happens, their own life safety, but protect the buildings going forward and it protect the economy and protect the health of the community. So fabulous work. Uh, I loved reading the survey results and I look forward to this discussion. I applaud you all for pushing ahead and leading the way in an issue that sometimes gets shunted to the side, even though it's of paramount importance. So kudos to all, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Alice. We're thrilled that you're here. Moving on, I would like to introduce our panel um, today. Uh, my colleagues are joining me um, remotely, so we have a hybrid presentation here. Um, 
And so I'd like to introduce them. So I'm sort of going from right to left on the slide. Um, first is Marianne Armstrong. Um, Marianne is a research council officer with Canada's National Research Council, NRC, the Construction Research Center. Um, for the past year, she has led a new research program in support of the Canadian National Model Building Codes, um, as well as engaged key stakeholders in the transformation of the Canadian code system towards increasing harmonization in provincial, territorial, and national codes. Before this, she managed the Climate Resilient Buildings and Core Public Infrastructure Initiative to integrate climate resiliency into Canadian building and infrastructure codes, standards, and guidelines. Um, and Marianne is currently spearheading the effort to develop a five-year continuation of this climate adaptation work. background in residential energy efficiency. She's a member of the Professional Engineers of Ontario, holds a Master of Science in Industrial Design from the University of New South Wales, Sydney, and a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Queen's University in Kingston. Next is Neil Savory, who is the Chief Executive of the Australian Building Codes Board, which has responsibility for developing the national codes and standards for building construction in Australia. Neil is currently engaged in promoting improvements to the national building regulatory systems to help improve practitioner compliance and lift productivity through a change in the business model that puts a focus on access, awareness, and understanding of the codes. Uh, prior to his current position, Neil was a member of the Australian Building Codes Board for 11 years, uh, where he was the Deputy Commissioner of the Victorian Building and Plumbing Industry Commissions, the Chief Planning Executive for the Australian Capital Territories uh, Planning and Land Authority, and the Executive Director of Planning South Australia. Neil has also worked as a senior town planner in local government, private practice, and has been the national president of the Planning Institute of Australia. Neil holds qualifications in town planning, urban design, and ecologically sustainable development. He's a registered planner, a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, and an adjunct professor in urban design. We do not have colleagues from New Zealand joining us today. Um, because it's 2 a.m. there. And so we gave, our, we gave our colleagues a pass. But Rolf Fenner, who was the author of the paper, the main author, um, is going to represent his colleagues in New Zealand as much as possible. Um, and I, I really have to give a lot of credit to Rolf, um, who, as the author of this paper, had to take a large, a very large amount of country data and distill it into this cohesive document that we've that we've put on the website today. Um, again, all of the files can be found at www.globalresiliency.org. So Rolf is a registered planner and a fellow of the Planning Institute of Australia. Until recently, he was employed as a senior project officer with the Australian Building Codes Board, uh, managing building resiliency. Before this, he was deployed through the Australian Volunteers Program as an urban development planner with Triuga Municipality in Eastern Nepal. Rolf has held the positions of National Chief Policy Officer with the Planning Institute of Australia and Senior Policy Advisor with the Australian Local Government Association. During his time in Canberra, he has developed an extensive appreciation of the diverse range of national policy issues impacting local government through his participation at multiple ministerial council and senior official meetings. His strategic policy skills included cities, urban governance, regional development, housing, heritage, climate change, settlement, and indigenous affairs. So please join me remotely in uh, welcoming this distinguished panel. And together we are going to talk to you about the, um, the, the findings um, of the Global Resiliency Dialogue. And before I turn it over to Neil, I just also want to introduce my colleague, Ryan Kolker, who's my partner in crime on this project. Um, Ryan is the Vice President of uh, Innovation for the International Code Council. With that, Neil, take it away. I will, thank you. And I, look, I'll get into this uh, very quickly, but I do just want to acknowledge the International Codes Council for helping facilitate today's discussion. And also it's wonderful to see Alice again, uh, having uh, enjoyed her company a couple of years ago when we kicked this project off. My initial responsibility is to give you some insight into what the problem is uh, in, in the exercise that we are undertaking here. 
and then also to talk briefly about the definition that we've uh, currently drafted, because as you will understand, uh, it's quite critical that we have some sort of working definition to help us better focus our efforts. So the slide that you can see in front of you now is intended to uh, conceptualize. Neil, sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. We're going to get I um, we're going to get it to help that a little bit. It's just it's coming in and out. So do you want me to continue, Judy? Actually, go ahead because it's working right now. Okay. Go ahead. Let's let's go. So the slide that you've got in front of you is uh, a way of trying to conceptualize the problem uh, that we are uh, looking to address in this particular exercise. And in the first instance, it's about trying to align the way that building codes and standards are developed. And there's a particular technique and process associated with that, which is shown in the top bar of this diagram and align that to the climate science. And these two things have been somewhat foreign to each other, particularly in the context of what Judy has already described as needing to look at the future uh, climate and the science associated with that. So if we think about this in the context of the origins of this particular uh, group of uh, organizations, the second objective that we identified for ourselves was about enhancing the utility of existing codes, which have largely been designed in response to past climate and weather events to respond proportionately to rapid change and predicted climate uh, extreme weather events. So what we're trying to do there is put in context that our codes and standards do already make reference to uh, the need for buildings to respond to weather events be they cyclones, bushfires, wildfires, extreme wind, flooding, etc. But they are based on historic data. And that's true of all of the subject matter that's typically contained within building codes and standards. We, we are responsive, we are reactive to events. And it's through that process that we continue to enhance and update our codes and standards. What we're faced with here is a challenge or a problem that is uh, almost to the point that Alice was making in her introductory remarks, we are in a position where we can anticipate that there are going to be future extremes of weather beyond those that we have experienced. And therefore, are the codes and standards today fit for purpose? Are they going to enable buildings that will be built today and that will exist for between 50 to 100 years to survive or enable the occupants of those buildings to survive the types of events that they could reasonably be expected to experience in their lifetimes. So moving beyond that scenario, which of course is a problem in its own right, is the problem itself of then trying to uh, marry the technical uh, art of developing codes and standards, that is the technical know-how of how to build buildings, which we're pretty good at, understanding how structures before, perform and behave, understanding uh, the issues around fire safety, weatherproofing, et cetera, and putting that in the context of future events modeled on uh, climate science. So what the diagram clearly tries to illustrate is marrying those two processes together the process of developing building codes, getting you to the point at the right-hand side of the diagram, what is the right level of resilience and durability, alongside that of developing the science that we're going to need to underpin and provide the evidence base to justify those changes. And the reason why that's important um, comes to another part of the problem. Codes and standards are typically written for the purposes of providing minimum levels of regulation. Uh, so for that purpose, what we're trying to do is balance the cost of building buildings with what we're expecting them to perform. Uh, and that issue obviously raises questions around, is the science accurate enough to give us justification for the additional investment that's going to have to go into buildings to make them more resilient. 
knowing that that might cost a bit more up front, but the payback will be made down, downstream. And provided we can use that evidence base to enable us to justify those costs, then we have a way forward. Now, uh, in order to assist us in doing this, and uh, Ryan, I, I think you're running the slides, or Judy, if we want to move to the next slide, it's been critical for us to come up with some form of working definition. Uh, and I'm sure all of you at some point in your careers have been involved in trying to arrive at definitions. And I think this also goes to the point of the value and the importance of doing this as a collaborative exercise. If the four of these organisations went away and did it themselves, not only make, may it, it may take longer, but it more than likely would result in four different definitions. And when we come to present this to our decision makers, the people who make the policy decisions, everyone will start making comparisons and saying, well, why are the Canadians doing it that way and the Americans doing it this way? By having four jurisdictions coming together and saying, we have agreed on a working definition that we think best represents the way we can advance this process actually is a clear demonstration of how collaboration can work effectively and go to the point of reducing duplication, reducing effort, etc. Now, to get to this definition itself has, of course, taken a lot of effort. And uh, I would refer you to the uh, second survey report that has been published this work week, because embedded within that second survey report is uh, an explanation of how we have arrived at this definition, which we are saying is a living document. There is the opportunity to continue to refine this definition. But if I just refer to that part of the report, it talks about defining the climate resilience of buildings uh, based on the concept of climate resilience. So what we're trying to do here is apply the uh, the issue of climate resilience to the art of building buildings. So you can't then just pick up the Oxford Dictionary of Resilience and apply it and expect building regulators to be able to use it in that context. And so we need to focus specifically on the resilience of buildings and using the common elements of the descriptions. And what we've extracted from that, and we've used other definitions that are used by other regulators in this space to help draw this out is identifying there's a what, there's a when, and there is a purpose. And when you start to uh, break all of that down and apply it to building codes, that, which are generally focused on achieving the goals of life, safety, and amenity, and sustainability, you start to realise that there's a need to then integrate the goal of building resilience. So we need to expand our understanding of that and we need to adapt the way that we undertake the development of building codes uh, as part of that. So it's important to bound the resilience to the what in the definitional element. While building codes cover multiple hazard types, the current focus, as has already been described, is going to be on those climatic events that greatly influence the sorts of hazards that buildings might experience. So we're not talking about earthquakes, uh, seismic activity. We're not talking about storm surge in terms of the force of nature in things like storm surge naturally cause you to immediately say, can a code usefully uh, um, resist those types of events? Whereas it's probably more appropriate not to put a building in a, in a location where storm surge is going to occur. So where we get to is what is on this slide. This is the working definition. It tries to bring all of those elements together. And I'll read it out for you. Climate resilience in the context of buildings is the ability of a building structure and its component parts to minimize loss of functionality and recovery time without being damaged to an extent that is disproportionate to the intensity of a number of current and scientifically predicted future extreme climactic conditions. And just on that last point, it draws on the criticality 
of having an evidence base in order to ground the sorts of codes and standards we think we're going to need to develop for the purpose of making buildings more resilient. Thanks, Judy. Uh, no, not thanks, Judy. I am now handing on to Marianne. Thanks, Neil. Um, so we're going to pass over to the, the survey design and get down to, to what we did and, and what we found. So the survey itself was designed to focus on current challenges and potential strategies to incorporate future focused climate science and risk into building codes and standards. So to do this, we put together a series of questions that you'll see in the appendix of the report. So we're not going to read all the questions out today. So please do have a look at what we asked. Um, each of the countries circulated the survey to a wide range of stakeholders in each country. So stakeholders included engineers and designers, climate scientists, uh, national level regulators, municipalities and enforcement officials, disaster and emergency response officials, home builders, standards developers, and researchers, and I'm sure a few more that we're, we're missing from that list. Um, the goal of the survey was really to collect this large variety of views on a number of topics. Um, the first was really on understanding where should we go from here? Like what is the ultimate view of how the building codes should look like if they are to achieve resilient goals? Um, and what are the barriers to achieving that? We also looked at what are the current limitations of our codes? Are they able to, to address climate change in their current form? And if not, what needs to be addressed? Also, we looked at research. So we looked at the research, the science, the climate science, the building science to understand both what is out there currently, but also what advances are needed really to be able to support codes and standards. And more importantly, in what form is that information and that evidence needed? Because I think there's a lot of information out there, but more specifically, the codes need it in a certain way. Um, additionally, we looked at what guidance is needed. So including how do we choose the climate change scenario? Um, how do we deal with things such as design service life? And we get a variety of views on, on both of those, I think from each of the different countries, but I'll let Rolf go into that in a minute. Um, we also looked at how to engage with stakeholders and communicate the needs to bring everybody on board. And I think it's a, a unique space where we start to look at needing to involve more stakeholders into the code system. So getting people's views on, on who those stakeholders are and who we need to have on board is very important. And finally, uh, we wanted to also understand what else is needed beyond codes and regulation to achieving a culture of resilience? So while codes has a role to play, there are other policy instruments out there that can complement it um, or actually might be even more effective than, than codes. So that is what we were trying to, to get out of the survey, trying to understand uh, all these different aspects. Um, as mentioned, if you wanna dig further into the questions, they're, they're in the report, but I think we all want to get down to the takeaways and understand what, what we found out in the survey. So I'm gonna pass this over to Rolf, thank you. Thanks, uh, Marianne. Can I uh, begin by acknowledging that uh, I am presenting to you from the, on the traditional lands of the Gumbangia people of the mid north coast of New South Wales. And I pay my respects to their elders, both past, present and future. Um, as lead, as uh, Judy mentioned, as lead author of the second report, the high level takeaways can be summarised as follows. And bear in mind, uh, the report is 35, 36 pages in length, and I've only got about five minutes to run through some of the really high level uh, takeaways. So um, I've kind of condensed those into the, the seven that you see on the screen at the moment. So Number one, the, the vast majority of respondents were in general agreement that building codes and standards are an effective way to deliver personal safety, amenity, accessibility, and productivity outcomes. Two, regardless of acknowledging the importance and value of having more climate responsive, resilient building codes and standards, the stakeholders surveyed are in agreement that existing building codes as they exist today are limited in addressing changing extreme weather events and a range of natural hazards risks, uh, particularly heat stress. Uh, three, survey respondents believed more 
can and must be done in enhancing resilience of buildings and structures, but that this doesn't mean that building codes and standards are the silver bullet. Quality of workmanship in construction, certification processes, building materials, ongoing and regular maintenance, and education of property owners, developers, and the community are equally important. And of course, reducing the energy use and embodied energy in building, construction, operation, in, and operation cannot be, um, cannot be forgotten. Four, enhancing building codes and standards is highly dependent on the considerable challenges associated with climate science. Specific challenges identified included climate modelling and the actual development of climate scenarios. In essence, what will the future climate and natural hazard risk profiles look like? Those are challenges in all of the Kansas partner countries. Five and six, really, we, we can bring together. Um, closely related to the challenges of climate modelling, especially downscaling and adopting the right RCP for future scenarios, more work is required in, in coming to terms with acceptable levels of climate risk and what performance thresholds or targets future buildings should be designed to achieve. For instance, in Australia, you know, are six-star residential dwellings adequate for, say, the next 20, 40 or 60 years? How building regulations are currently evaluated, that is, assessing their cost-benefit value, was identified as another limitation. Put simply, how can we better assess future benefits of resilience against the costs of construction today, a point raised by Neil. Seven, finally, if we are to achieve more climate resilient building codes and standards, survey respondents agreed that all decision makers, that is all levels of government, the industry, sector, insurers, bankers, researchers, the real estate sector, investors, NGOs, down to mum and dad uh, homeowners need to be engaged and participate in the resilience journey. Improving the messaging of the value of resiliency was raised by most respondents, irrespective if they were North American, Australian or New Zealand. So I've rushed through a lot of the, the high level kind of um, uh, takeaways from, from the research itself. and. Um, one probably can summarise this, and I'm, I'm leaving enough time for, for questions and answers, but the diverse stakeholders, irrespective of nationality, are, are all strongly advocating for building regulations to be fit for the future and responsive for a changing climate and hazard risk profile. Having said this, it is worth reminding ourselves that many of today's buildings, regardless of use, residential, commercial, entertainment, educational, health related, um, approved under current building regulations and standards will be around for 50 to 75 years. Other significant public buildings will be, will be used well into the next century. How do we ensure the buildings are fit for the future climate and risk profiles is the challenge that all Kansas partners, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the uh, United States of America and the Canadians are struggling with at the moment. The, the report itself goes through, um, goes through these challenges that, uh, that were set by Marianne in terms of the survey questions in, in more detail. The individual uh, feedback that we get from, from each of the country is, uh, is actually contained in a separate appendices to, to provide that kind of nuisance of, of uh, uh, individual kind of uh, feedback that we, we were getting. But with our question, there is a general agreement across uh, the four partners that this building resilience is worthy of pursuing. Uh, the agreement in terms of what resilience needs in a, in a building and climate context um, is also supported. And that the, that the linkage between the building science and the climate science 
is the real challenge that we need to actually resolve. And I might leave it at that, given that we're still uh, needing to run through very briefly the individual takeaways that are coming out of each of the, the partner organisations. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Rolf. That was great. Um, just before we move on to the uh, individual partner or the individual country takeaways, I wanted to remind our remote audience that if you have questions for the panel, particularly as we're going through the details of the, the survey results, please use the Slido app to ask questions and we will have time at the end to get to that. Um, with that, I'm gonna ask um, Marianne to start us off by, by letting us know sort of what the takeaways from the Canadian uh, portion of the survey were. Marianne. Yeah, thank you, Judy. I think um, it's nice to speak more specifically to Canada because I think we're quite unique in a, in a few ways. One is that we're warming at twice the global rate and more in the North. So we're seeing many impacts of, of climate change already. Um, but we're also in a unique position where we've started working on the integration of resilience into codes and standards for the past five years, thanks to the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change. So Canada already has a number of stakeholders engaged in this conversation and many lessons learned and to share. So it was nice uh, to do this survey, to gather together a lot of this information in one place. One of the main takeaways from the Canadian survey was that Codes is only one of the many tools that are needed to reach building resilience goals. So we're, what we need really is a suite of tools, including guidance, standards, training, de-risking of technologies and methods, uh, incentive programs, education, and others, all to move us towards this goal. Another important takeaway for us was that resilience is only one of many different priorities currently facing our code system. And I imagine it's similar in, in many countries. Um, this includes energy efficiency, accessibility, health on the heels of COVID right now, all very important considerations within our codes that need to be carefully considered and balanced. And we only have limited resources to address these through the code system. So solutions are needed. And my final takeaway that I'll share today is that we also need to bring all the stakeholders along. Um, in Canada, we have a model code, which means that we can produce it, but ultimately to be uh, put in place, it needs to be adopted by our provinces and territories. So in order to do so, we need to make sure that all considerations of stakeholder views are considered in our code system. Um, and ultimately for the discussion on climate change resilience, we need to engage new views that weren't traditional to the system, including views on societal impacts, health impacts, community design, and many others. So a new wave of thought needs to be brought in order to consider resilience in our country and I believe in others as well. So I'm gonna pass this now to Neil for his thoughts. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, look, there will obviously be some overlap here with, uh, with Rolf's general overview, but there are six key takeaways uh, for me from the Australian chapter. The first of those is the importance of considering existing codes and whether or not they are fit for purpose. So our stakeholders are telling us one of the first things we need to do is test the currency of our existing standards as they relate to matters of natural hazard events uh, influenced by climate. The second is the importance of developing and gathering data to inform how to improve building codes and again, of course, that's one of the objectives of the Kansas and Global Resilience uh, Dialogue is to be able to share data. And in fact, uh, Marianne's reference to the Canadian work of the past five years means that we've already benefited from her sharing that information with all of us. Thirdly, that building codes are only part of the solution to making the built environment more resilient and certainly planning, the role of planning is seen as a critical feature in that because of course, if planning allows for buildings to be put in harm's way in the first instance, it makes the job of uh, developing codes and standards to make buildings more resilient that much harder. Educating building code developers and decision makers to interpreting and understanding climate projections is identified 
uh, as an important feature. And, you know, the reality is that for many of us, this is, is a new challenge. Uh, just as the pandemic creates new challenges for us, so does this topic. So it can't just be assumed that those who work in these areas have an, uh, an automatic expertise to deal with the challenges. The uh, second last is uh, the importance of continuing to work towards mitigating greenhouse gas emissions from buildings, uh, because without that, it just makes the job of making buildings more resilient that much more difficult. Uh, bearing in mind that buildings generally around the world are responsible for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions. So code developers have enormous capability to contribute to the mitigation effort through making buildings more energy efficient. And the last takeaway message uh, is the importance of understanding overlapping natural hazard risks. So not to look at each natural hazard in isolation of uh, its potential interaction with other natural hazards. Thank you, Judy. Over to you. Thanks, Neil. Um, from the US side, we had five main takeaways um, and we had a diverse group of stakeholders, but it was interesting that all of them um, agreed that there's definitely value in integrating more resilient features focused on future looking scientific data into building codes and fortifying both new and existing buildings uh, for resilience against future hazards. But everyone also agreed that the challenge is how to achieve the balance between protecting buildings both new and existing in the future with making or keeping them affordable, um, especially to vulnerable populations. Um, so that's a big takeaway. A second takeaway is that um, in the US because the adoption and enforcement of building codes is localized, um, the greatest climate data need is for more localized models that utilize the baselines that climate and building scientists can agree upon. And additional, additionally to that, the, there's a need for, uh, the need for more resilient structures is also very localized. Um, and even based on anticipated events that utilize um, forward focused scientific data, which also needs to be localized. So right now there's a lack of high quality data at the local scale, uh, and that's necessary to inform the local codes. Um, third, building owners and designers uh, recognize the uncertainty and the numerous strategies to address future climate risks that are currently being used. Um, but they're looking for authoritative, an authoritative source to sort of cut through the confusion and just provide some direction. We, we, I did get a lot of sort of uh, frustration from, uh, from a lot of the responses. You know, people want to do something. Um, there's their, their uncertainty of protect, projecting future risk is recognized. Um, and there's a sense that the climate scientists and the developers of building codes uh, and standards just need to agree on a path and do it. Just do it with the anticipation that the future looking science will need to be recalibrated. Um, regularly as the codes are updated. And finally, um, about the current code language, um, it does not sufficiently incorporate up-to-date climate research and provide actionable requirements. So there's a need for comprehensive monitoring and universal collection of current climate data that can be used to inform code provisions to address climate um, related risks of the future. So I think there's a lot, again, as Neil said, that we can be doing um, together to kind of solve some of these problems. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rolf to very quickly um, give us a high level takeaway on the New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand report. Thanks, Judy. Uh, kia ora. Um, again, as Judy mentioned, the New Zealanders uh, hopefully um, in their beds uh, at 10 to three in the morning in Wellington at the moment, they send their regards. So uh, very briefly, they've, uh, they've argued that there are four key um, take home messages coming from the New Zealand survey. One being that the building codes uh, without question have a potential to move beyond their current focus on life safety to address issues of building resilience and occupant wellbeing in the face of expected changes in climate. Two, they, uh, the perceived barriers to strengthening codes and standards in New Zealand include anticipated uh, increased upfront costs of becoming more resilient, 
as well as, uh, as, well as perceived lack of industry capacity and expertise. And in New, Ze in New Zealand's case, uh, housing affordability or uh, unaffordability is uh, even more severe than it is in Australia. So um, that is a big issue for the New Zealanders. Uh, thirdly, the New Zealand stakeholders agreed that there was a role for the New Zealand central agencies to fund and curate better climate data and related research, research initiatives. And finally, there are a number of current drivers for change happening in the New Zealand resilience space. These include that the New Zealand government is developing a national adaptation plan that will address climate resilience across the whole of the New Zealand economy. And secondly, there's a current restructuring of the national resource management regulatory system, um, which offers an opportunity to strengthen the connection between central and local governments, as well as uh, how the New Zealanders build with where they build, the, the issue of, of the importance of, of planning. And again, just very briefly, uh, unlike Canada, Australia, USA, uh, New Zealand is a unitary form of government. You only have central and local. There are no states or provinces. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Rolf. Um, we're going to briefly uh, talk about what's next because the this report is, does not represent the end from for the global resiliency dialogue. It was an intermediate step, um, as I mentioned. I think um, the next, the, the ultimate goal of this group is to create international resilience guidelines. And so um, the preliminary outline of those guidelines is displayed on the slide for everyone to see. Um, and the plan is to build on the knowledge. We, got, we have a lot of information from these first two surveys. Um, so we're gonna build on the knowledge and um, really, we're, we're ready to start work on the, on the guidelines next month um, with a first draft expected uh, in mid-2022. Um, and it will be widely circulated for comment. Um, the guidelines will be designed as a tool. You know, we all have different regulatory systems in our four countries, and this is not a tool that's limited to our countries. It's something that we want, um, we want jurisdictions around the world to refer to, um, regardless of the current building regulatory system. So we'll be seeking input from a global set of stakeholders, um, including and particularly, especially um, those with emerging economy expertise. Um, so that's the plan for what's next um, from the global resiliency dialogue perspective. Um, I think maybe Neil and Marianne um, could add just a word about what you what you think um, the the utility of the eventual guidelines will be in Australia and Canada, and um, I'll give I'll give an overview of the U.S. before we open it up for questions. So, Neil. Yes, just quickly, Judy. I think the critical thing for us is that it's going to enable us to have a benchmark. So we're all going to go away and now develop or or review our codes and standards. And having the guidelines there is actually going to enable us to benchmark that work at a local level against something that's been agreed uh, amongst four representative uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and that, that ultimately is going to help, if you like, legitimise and justify the sorts of changes that may come about uh, as a result of that local work. Beyond that, uh, I think you've already adequately described what we see as the, the broad benefit of these guidelines. Thank you. Marianne? Sure. From the Canadian perspective, we're at a point in our code system where we've developed a lot of information, research, science needed to support the move towards resilience. And we're on the precipice, really, of those policy discussions, the important policy discussions that will enable it to happen. So for us, um, the resilience guidelines and, and the surveys and the information that we're generating together is important to help advise those discussions that are gonna happen within the Canadian system. So that's where we see the value. Thank you. Um, and in the United States, you know, we think we see this as a resource that um, will feed into our code development process. The International Code Council facilitates the development of building codes. We don't write the code. So we have a process and this document can become a resource that will feed into code change proposals. Um, at the same time, some jurisdictions may choose to use some of the suggestions in the guidelines to, as an overlay to their codes. 
Um, right now, the federal government has a huge focus on resilience, um, and we've been hearing a lot about it here in Glasgow. Um, some agencies, some federal agencies may consider to use them on their own buildings, um, and they could also form the foundation for bro broader programs that are developed and promoted nationally, but implemented by states and localities. Um, also on the federal level, um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NIST and NOAA, are um, working to gather climate science data to support this type of work. Um, and so having guidance from the global code community can support their efforts. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, we do see global relevance in, in producing these guidelines, not just from the US perspective, but I think from all four of our, uh, you know, all four of our organizations um, that especially there, there's import for emerging economies that are specifically threatened with um, increasing hazards and have a need for adaptation and resilience, um, many of them without building codes. Um, so this would give them a, a platform to start pursuing um, resilient strategies in the built environment. So with that, um, I know Ryan's been monitoring the Slido questions. I'm going to I'm going to leave it to him to pick some of the some of the most exciting questions to ask to our panel. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll start with actually one of the ones that uh, on Slido that got the most uh, sort of uh, requests. Um, Marianne, you mentioned sort of the slew of folks that provided feedback, you know, to each of us. Um, one was particularly the insurance industry. So um, any ideas on uh, sort of the role that the industry, uh, insurance industry in particular, can play on uh, advancing resilience standards in particular? So from our experience in, in Canada, the insurance industry has been a big advocate for change, obviously, to, to reduce insured losses, uh, to reduce damage. So they've played a very important part in, in bringing it to the attention of, of everyone across Canada saying we need to do this change. Um, we do have to be careful, though, that we're making changes to codes in a way that addresses everyone's concerns, including the insurance agency. But they're definitely one of the important players in this space. Ryan, could I just add to that response, please? Absolutely. Uh, so like Canada, the Insurance Council of Australia uh, has played a very significant role in advocating for in improved standards within building codes around the issue of resilience. And obviously economic loss is a key driver for them. But where we see one of the critical values of uh, insurers is the economic loss data that they can provide to us to assist us when we come to undertaking regulatory impact analysis, which we haven't talked about and we haven't got time to talk about, but one of the challenges ultimately for all of us is going to be how we justify possible changes to make buildings more resilient. And having good data that identifies what the costs of inaction are based on current and predicted events is going to be of, of enormous benefit uh, in regulatory impact analysis and insurers have critical data to assist in that regard. Thanks. And there's another great reason that Alice is here today. She just chaired a commission in California on this very topic. So I'm gonna let her speak about that. This is a very important question. How does insurance intersect uh, with the built environment? Building codes uh, are of interest to insurance companies. The uh, California is facing a type of crisis in its uh, insurance protection. Uh, there is a growing gap because of wildfire and a reluctance of private insurers to continue to insure in those areas. Our working group for the California Department of Insurance, which I chair, has just issued a report talking about solutions for three perils. Uh, that's heat, wildfire and flood. Uh, and you will see building codes mentioned there, uh, including then getting to the issues that uh, Neil mentioned, the land use, that this is all really a, a whole of community response for some of these threats. Uh, I would commend it to you. I think it's the first report looking at how does insurance address the growing risks of climate change and how do we 
avoid losing insurance coverage as these events get bigger and more damaging. Thanks, Alex. Alex. Um, I guess, um, you know, as we're, we're looking to, to wrap up, um, you know, we, we talked about certainly the role of um, the four organizations in, uh, you know, leading this effort, but how do you see this expanding beyond our four organizations and how do we get the word out to, you know, other countries who are certainly dealing, you know, with these same or similar types of challenges? Do you want me to go first, Ryan? Um, so currently I chair the group that uh, Judy mentioned at the start, the IRCC. Um, that's 15 like-minded organisations from across, across the globe, representing most of the geographic uh, zones of, of the world. And we have and will continue to share this information and encourage those other countries to participate in, in the arrangements. Uh, they of themselves, you would appreciate, have their own networks, both internal and external. So by word of mouth, we would hope that uh, they, they broaden the, the expression of this work. Uh, the website that's been developed by the ICC to support the Global Resilience Dialogue uh, can and will continue to be widely promoted. Uh, there are other groups that we're all uh, involved with who have broader national and international representation. And so again, I think the vehicle that we've created, that is the four organizations, becomes the platform through which we have our own networks that we can just continue to broaden everyone's awareness of the subject, the work that we're doing, and the opportunity for them to participate, or ultimately, as Judy has said, borrow. I mean, we want to give this away because we know that there are others who just don't have the same capacity as we do. Thank you. I, I'll just add to that. And, um, you know, I, I, there's a Australia pavilion here at COP26, and I, I stopped by um, that pavilion the other day to, to talk to them about this initiative. And um, someone from the, the sort of overseas aid ministry or the, the, or the equivalent of the US State Department Neil's going to tell me the name. Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Depart Thank you. Um, and as well as our State Department, our U.S. Um, uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, um, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, all of these overseas aid organizations are, are interested in providing resilient solutions to um, emerging economies. And so I think that's another, um, another venue for, for these to be circulated. And one, one other venue um, is ISO. You know, um, ICC is the U.S. tag administrator for uh, to ISO TC 59, which uh, is responsible for the development of standards related to buildings and civil engineering works. And so we would have the opportunity to uh, bring these guidelines to ISO as a potential international uh, standard. So I think there are a lot of avenues. We're all very well connected. Um, and, you know, we will also rely on those of you here and, you know, in our um, in our audience uh, virtually to uh, to help us spread the word. Uh, we're not charging for this. It's a it's a it's a, a, a work of um, a labor of love, so to speak, and and something that we we all uh, are very passionate about doing. And so, um, you know, we, we hope that we'll have global community support in spreading the word. Marianne, do you want to add anything? I think you and Neil have covered it quite well. I don't think I have anything to add. Thank you. Yeah, so why don't we um, take one more uh, question. Um, and, and Neil, you, you touched on this a little bit, but um, sort of the evolving nature of codes beyond life safety um, to think about you know, things like a property and what buildings mean to communities, um, but then also looking at sort of the intersection of codes with um, sort of the broader building regulatory framework. So land use planning, uh, those sorts of things. Any thoughts on, on sort of how that pathway develops and how we can best uh, sort of encourage that broader thinking uh, and recognition of sort of the, the role of codes as, as a piece of that, but also sort of a, an important collaboratory tool to help advance uh, larger resilience initiatives? Yeah, so just quickly, Ryan, I think core to that, if we go back to the definition, 
that we, we've uh, hopefully got some degree of resolution on because the purpose of that definition is to illustrate that for this exercise, we've got to think of codes and standards beyond their convention of the past 30 whatever number of years to go beyond just life safety and think about the performance of buildings in response to climatic events such that not only are they there to pre preserve occupants' uh, life safety, but be able to perform and function to a reasonable extent after the event has passed. Whereas at the moment, conceptually, the thinking of codes, the design of codes is the building can effectively be redundant after the event if it has served the purpose of saving the occupant's life. And that's where we want to get to. The definition helps us do that. But of course, all of us individually in our countries and, and in other countries need to be able to uh, have our policymakers accept and agree to that approach to enable us then to start work on developing the standards that will apply that principle. Great. Marianne? I think we need to look at again, the role of the codes within that landscape of other policy tools. Um, as they're written now in Canada, at least, you know, we can't really go beyond the building itself. And in order to address the resiliency, we need to address things such as community design, uh, landscaping, uh, forestry maintenance. Like, so there's many different things that are involved in, in this space. So it's looking at it as a whole, understanding where there might be gaps in those tools, the need for additional guidance or potentially regulation. Uh, and looking at it more holistically. And within that discussion, then you start to look at our new objectives in the building code needed to address some of these gaps that aren't currently being addressed within that suite of policy tools. And it's definitely something that the building codes can't address alone. So there is that need for that higher level, um, really roadmap to achieving the resilience targets. And with that brilliant answer, I'm going to uh, bring our panel to a close with many thanks to our audience, both uh, in person and uh, joining us virtually and to those of you who will be watching the recording. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your questions. Please continue to follow the work of the Global Resiliency Dialogue at www.globalresiliency.org. And uh, with thanks to the Global uh, the Global Alliance for Buildings and Communities who have hosted this, um, this event. Um, more information about the Global ABC community is uh, available on this slide. And uh, wishing everyone a good day and, a, and an excellent COP26. Thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.